so we're going to talk about cardiac MR principles. I know it was tough going through those cases yesterday prior to having this lecture, just the way that things worked out. We couldn't do this lecture first, but um, you'll have another lecture by Raymond Kwong tomorrow. He's going to talk more about specific disease. So here we're going to talk about principles of acquisition and technical factors. We'll also go over some artifacts. We'll do some questions. Okay, first we're going to talk about cardiac MR physics. Does anybody know what kind of image this is here? How would you, anybody describe this technique? Huh? Well, that's in the brain and it doesn't move, right? PTI doesn't move. This is 4D phase contrast, so 4D flow, superimposed on top of a rotating... SSFP frame with a rotating frame of reference. So you have the 4D flow going in, in and out of plane and four dimensions overlaid on top of this rotating frame. So this is a routine part of the exam that we perform here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We've never done this. So this is from a, a group in, in Sweden that does advanced visualization, the Center for Medical Imaging and Visualization. I've done some research work with them, so I feel comfortable just ripping that off of their website. But it looks uh, really cool. So this is kind of the the pinnacle of what, what you can potentially achieve in cardiac MR. We're going to talk about gating issues. We'll talk about cine, tissue characterization, perfusion, viability, and this is somewhat in the order that you acquire the exam. Then we'll go over artifacts, a little bit about phase contrast and MR angiography. So first and foremost, the most important issue with three Tesla is gating. And one of the problems that we have when we put a patient in the magnet is this thing called the magnetohydrodynamic effect, which is not something from the Avengers. Um, this is a real phenomenon that happens. So as the blood comes across the aortic arch, it actually generates a signal. And that signal happens in the part of the cardiac cycle where there's the most aortic flow. So the problem is, is that the scanner um, sees this artifact right at the, at the location of the T wave. So if you look as we go up in field strength, this artifact gets worse and worse. And notice how it looks the same here, but look at the scale. This is three times more the scale than this. So as you would think that as your field strength goes up, everything just gets better in cardiac MR, but your artifacts also get worse. So more artifacts. So there's a couple things that we can do. To combat that, we can try to put the leads in the best position. Lead placement is scanner specific, so some scanners have three leads, some scanners have four leads, the colors may be different for different scanners. Generally, the, this lead should be in the location of the SA node in an ideal situation. This should be over the apex of the heart, and this should be sort of equidistant if you draw a line here and cut it in half, and then went perpendicular to that line, 90 degrees, and half the distance should be where you should put that lead ideally. Now, everybody's heart is in a different location in the chest, and we'll get into that on the next slide. Another technique that we use is called vector ECG gating. What ve vector gating does is it tries to figure out what is the direction of flow and to sort of not pay attention to that aortic flow, that magnetohydrodynamic magneto effect, which is not going in the same direction as the LV. It's going in this direction. So it tries to, to use that phenomenon to improve the ECG. What this group did is they looked at the scout images and, and replaced or reoriented the leads based on those positions that we just talked about. So they actually put little vitamin E capsules on the skin, but you can actually see the leads if you look on, on just a routine localizer sequence. You have to do enough slices to see them, obviously. So they reposition them actually using the 3D workstation. You don't have to be this precise with it, so we do this at the scanner. Um, and the techs will look, and they, they do most of this themselves, but they'll look at the actions what the techs do first is they'll look at the signal. If it's not good, they'll just move the leads around and hope for the best. But if, and if they come to get you and need better assistance, this is kind of what we do. We don't use the 3D workstation, but we say we do need to go, go a couple centimeters down here, go a couple centimeters over to the right based on where we see the leads. In this paper, this is the amount of proven that they saw. Um, so in 72% of the time by reviewer one and 67% of the time by reviewer two, this procedure improved the signal. Sometimes it got worse. Sometimes it didn't get better. 
And this is an example of pre-correction and post-correction. Oftentimes you put the patient in the magnet, the ECG signal looks like this, looks great. Then you put them in the magnet and it looks like that. Um, so what, what you have to do is you have to keep the patient on the table outside the magnet for 10 seconds. The scanner will try to commit this to memory and then adjust when it sees this based on what it knows from the 10 second run that it did ahead of time. Now, gate changes during the scan, that, that can often be a problem. There's not a whole lot you can do with that outside of trying to relearn this and move the leads around. Obviously, we want to shave the patient, all the stuff that we talked about in the, in the CT lecture um, to prepare to make sure we have the best contact with the patient. Okay, um, next we'll talk about pulse sequences. First, we'll talk about CINE, which is really the, the hallmark of cardiac MRI and what separates it from other modalities is our ability to quantitate blood flow. And we do that mainly with this bright blood sequence. And CINE means that we're playing a movie. And we're seeing it throughout the entire cardiac cycle or that it's moving. So we have an example of two different bright blood images here. So first question, how many segments are in the AHA recommended model? So most people got it right. So 17, so the, 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 16, the 17 segments is the true LV apex, and I'll show you that on the next slice, but that's how we get from 16 to 17, is the true LV apex. So initially the 16, these were all models that have been proposed, actually at one point in time or another. In echo, a lot of times they don't see the true LV apex, which is why that wasn't initially included. Um, but with MR, we definitely see that. <laughs> Move that to the next one. Okay. So here in this next slide, this shows the different segments. And the way I like to think about the segments is to think about the apex first. So at the apex, there's four segments. There's the anterior wall, inferior wall, septal, and lateral walls. As we go to the mid and the base, we subdivide the septum and the lateral walls into anterior and inferior. So anteroseptal, inferoseptal, anterolateral, inferolateral. Same thing at the mid. And then we do a long axis view, both in perfusion and in cine images, to get that 17th segment, which we see here. Here's an example of the short axis stack. This is the stack that we use for, for quantification of ventricular volumes, and thus we can get ejection fraction from that. So short axis to the LV. So all of cardiac imaging is done relative to the short to the the, the axis of the left ventricle. So short axis is we're bisecting that long axis of the left ventricle, which goes through from the point of the LV apex through the center of the mitral valve. So that's the, 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 length, the line that's going to give us that axis. To generate a four-chamber view, which we're going to see next here, we cut through the widest part of the right ventricle. So that'll show us the most amount of RV. This is a horizontal long axis stack. This is a stack that we, we get for mass evaluation. So here we see a mass here in the right ventricular apex. We can also do a couple specialized views. So here's a paraseptal view, which is a, a vertical long axis, which is mainly for the right ventricular apex, but it will go all the way through the LV. And that's to get a better look at the right ventricle. And we, we do all of these views in order to have a similar appearance among different modalities. So if we're comparing echo images to nuclear medicine images to cardiac MR images to cardiac CT image, images, we have to have some frame of reference. So this is totally different than what we learn in radiology. In radiology, it has to do with axial, coronal, and sagittal to the patient as they lie on the table in the CT scanner, generally speaking. So in, in the heart, everything is relative to that long, long axis through the LV. This is a nice review paper on optimizing pulse sequences. So here, balance SSFP, this, this is the, the main sequence that we use, which gives us bright blood. There's a couple different names for it, TrueFist, Balance F FFE, Fiesta, and those are different vendor names, but SSFP is the, the non-vendor specific name. But it, this is actually a GRE sequence, which uses an alternating large flip angle to achieve steady state magnetization in three axes. The signal intensity is a ratio of T2 to T1. It's technically the square root of T2 over T1, which is mostly high for blood and low for myocardium, so that gives us good contrast between the blood pool and the myocardium. These are the names for the different vendors. This is just what I can never remember what these, these 
these acronyms mean, so I don't even have you guys try, but I just wanted to show you what they are in case you're interested. We can get some artifacts with this sequence. So with this sequence, essentially what we do is we rephase the signal each TR. When you do that, if there's any shifts in the magnetic field or magnetic field homogeneity, that's going to show up as these banding artifacts called dark band artifacts. And we only really see this in the SSFP image. We don't see that in the GRE image. In the GRE image, we apply a crusher gradient at the end of the TR. Basically kills all the signal, and we start fresh again. So that's how we don't get that off resonance from the rephasing or recycling of that signal. Here's just an example in some different views. So here we see on the short axis of the heart. And this can be a problem when we're tracing. So a lot, and this is worse than three Teslas, so we kind of have to interpolate through this slice and whenever we see this artifact. There's also a couple of tricks we can apply, which I'll show you. This one is related to in-plane flow. So often looking for jets at the, at the level of a valve in-plane is very difficult um, in the sequence, and we'll, we'll go to GRE whenever there's too much artifact. So one of the tricks that we can apply is called the frequency scouts. So here we're basically acquiring the same image at different frequencies. We can go from minus 300 to plus 300. So we look for the one where there's the least amount of artifact throughout the myocardium or the least amount of artifact for the area of interest. So if you're specifically looking for mitral valve regurgitation, you may want to pick the one where it looks the cleanest at the level of the mitral valve. So here's an example um, without it moving. So we would pick either one of these two would give us the best view of the entirety of the hearts. And this is the tech can just punch that number in and change it. So here's an another strategy. We can just switch to gradient echo, and we see none of this artifact anywhere in the image, where here we see it throughout all different parts of the image. Whenever you make this change, there's kind of no free lunch in cardiac MR. It's something that I like to, like to say. We give up temporal resolution um, because we have to have time for that that crush your gradient at the end, so we lose a little bit of temporal resolution. So if we're at 50 milliseconds temporal resolution here, which is kind of the, the max of what you want in Cine cardiac MR, if we just did nothing but change the GRE, it would jump the temporal resolution to about 80, to about 70 or 80 milliseconds. So then you have to make some adjustments to bring that temporal resolution back down by decreasing the spatial resolution or increasing or decreasing um, the number of segments acquired per TR, and we're going to go over segmenting in a second. So what that means is the segmented acquisition. So if you look, if you go back and look at this, this image, so it takes somewhere between 8 and 15 heartbeats to acquire this data. But we're only, it only looks like we're seeing one heartbeat, and we are. So we're fusing all of that data into one representative heartbeat in order to get the spatial resolution that we need. And this is sort of how we do that in the segmented approach. So if you look at, so this is different phases, and these are the different lines of case space per phase. So you can see lines um, one of case space, we have, and it correlates to these different bins. So there's no way we can fill all the lines for all the phases of case space in one cardiac cycle. So the, the strategy is to decrease the number of lines of case space. That's kind of the only way you can acquire all of that data in one RR interval. And there's a couple ways to do that. So here we have... Um, Images here which are segmented and some are real time. So does anybody want to guess as to which, which image is the segmented? There's two that are real time and there's one that's segmented. Just blurt it out. So who wants to vote for this one being segmented? How about this one? Okay, how about that one? So actually this is the one that's segmented. And the way that we can tell is because the patient happens to have an, art, an, an arrhythmia here. So when the patient has an arrhythmia and all eight of those beats aren't exactly the same in length, and we're also assuming the heart's going to beat and relax and be in exactly the same z-axis in space, we're going to have blurry motion. So when we have blurred motion, we know it has to be segmented. So you can't have blurred motion with a real-time image if your temporal resolution is low enough. But notice the signal. And the spatial resolution has gone down on these two. So we had to give up something. Here, in this image, we've given up temporal resolution. So here we're not able to really see the motion of the heart very well because the spatial resolution is about the same, but the temporal resolution is way worse. So this temporal resolution is almost 200 milliseconds here. This is terrible. 
where this is 50 milliseconds. Here, the temporal resolution, we kept the same at 50, millisec 50 milliseconds, but we cut down the, the case space that we filled with two different strategies. One, we reduced the matrix size. That reduces the lines. And we used an alternative case space filling strategy called radial. Normally, we do Cartesian, where we fill lines across in a horizontal box. Well, here we can do radial, which is spokes, and you can just not fill all the spokes is a way to do it. Um, and that's what this is. This is that radial. So whenever, we're, whenever we have patients that have arrhythmias, we'll automatically do this sequence by default to give us something where we can make a comment qualitatively on the motion. Okay, question. Good, so most people got it right. So green is correct on all, all of the slides. Um, so we have the other people got sarcoid and non-compaction. So non-compaction is a cardiomyopathy where the myocardium does not compact completely, so you should see increased trabeculation is the hallmark of that. And the ventricular wall is typically appears much thinner because a lot of it is non-compacted. It's just wispy, thin myocardium. Here, the myocardial wall actually looks thicker than normal. Right, so it kind of be the opposite of what we would think about non-compaction. Sarcoidosis can also make the heart uh, wall thick, potentially. Um, but we have the added pattern here of SAM, so we have outflow track obstruction, and here we see this jet of flow acceleration through the LVOT, which you're not going to see that really in sarcoidosis. Okay, good. Systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. You didn't know that, Kyrie Nandu? So what happens is whenever you have decreased um, distance in the LVOT, there's this effect called the um, Venturi effect. So you basically increase the, the velocity of the blood. It drops the pressure and sucks that anterior mitral leaflet into that space. When that happens, you actually get a little bit of, because the, the leaflet is being pulled from closing the mitral valve, you get some regurgitation also. So this is sort of an ant mini type of thing, which is why we're showing it to you now, so you get it right every other time you see this in board reviews and whatever. Okay. That is. So this is SSFP. So what kind of artifact is that? Yes, but the fancy name is from based on the previous slides. Huh? No. So the magnetohydrodynamic effect is not an artifact we see in the images. It causes the gating to be screwed up, specifically messes up the T wave, and the scanner thinks that's another R wave. That's the problem with the image D. This is the, the off-resonance artifact. Okay? So you have to be careful of that when you use SSFP to do an aorta study, a non-contrast aorta study, that you can have that there. It's important to know that so you know that that's not a dissection. And notice that it's, it's um, the signal changes with systole and diastole, and that's a technique that's used for non-contrast MRA, but we're not going to talk about that today. Okay. So we can also use Cine cardiac MR to do stress, the same way they do stress in the echo lab. So the way they do that is they give the patients dobutamine, and they look to see does the ventricle start to fail as we ramp up the demand. So here we see at rest, this is the size of the, the, the diastolic size of the ventricle. With low dose dobutamine, it's starting to get a little bit bigger. And at max dobutamine, it's, got, it's, 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 it's dilating here. And we see the same thing in stress. So in a normal person, as you give them dobutamine, it starts to become hyperdynamic. It should, the function should actually get better. And we can also use dobutamine for viability. So if you have a segment of myocardium that is hypokinetic, and if it's viable, potentially giving dobutamine, it will, it will improve the function of that segment. And if that function does improve, well, you know, obviously, it's worth revascularizing. It's worth giving it a chance to recover with re revascularization. Tagging, this is another Cine sequence that we use. There's two different types of tagging. We can do grid tagging or we can do line tagging. We do this really in two different scenarios. We do this to look for cardiac mass invasion in the heart. We also do this to look for pericardial adhesions, to see whether the myocardium is stuck to the pericardial wall or not. This technique was developed for myocardial strain and myocardial strain rates, which is still in the research world. We're still not using this clinically yet. And the way that they measure that 
is once we lay these radio frequency grid tags down, we can measure the deformation of this box. And the, the rate at which it deforms will tell us what the, the strain rate is. If the box doesn't deform, like here these boxes aren't moving, well this is either not myocardium, as in this case this is a fibroma in a patient, so this is not contractile tissue. So that's an another way that you can use it. So normally these should all shorten, they should all move. Here we have a mass outside of the heart, inseparable from the myocardium, and we should normally see these lines, so normally you should see these lines slip across each other, like here, and here there's no breakage of the lines, so then we're concerned that there's either adherence or invasion of the myocardium. This is a primary pericardial mesothelioma. So next, let's move on to tissue characterization. So this is where we use cardiac MRI to tell us what the tissue is based on the signal properties and the different pulse sequences. This is a great chart that I has put together for a book chapter that we wrote for Raymond Kwong, second edition of the book. So at the end of the lecture, there'll be a test on this chart. So you have three more seconds to memorize it. I'm kidding. We don't remember really any of these things too much because it's a lot of data. There's a couple of key ones that are worth remembering the signal characteristics of. Um, and so I'll, I'll refer you to this chart if you want to take a look. But, but this is always, and I can email this to you guys if you always want to just have it um, in your Dropbox somewhere so you can refer to it. But red is malignant, um, green is benign, and white is non-neoplastic conditions. And it tells us what happens during CINE, tissue characterization, and with contrast. Okay, we'll go over a few specific cases, and we'll also talk a little bit about the technique. So in order to get good tissue characterization, you either have to do T1 mapping or T2 mapping, which is still also largely a research tool. Outside of that, in the clinical realm, we need to make the blood pool black so that no effects from the blood pool affect the signal characteristics of the myocardium. And we do that by double inversion recovery. So the way it works, we have two double inversion, we have two inversion pulses, the first inversion pulse is non-slice selective. So it basically inserts, inverts all of the spins of the patient in the magnet. Right after that, we have a slice selective inversion pulse, which takes the signal in the slice, reverts it back to full signal. So everything that you're going to see in that slice is going to have its full signal recovered. Now, what we're counting on for this to work is that the blood that's in that slice will have moved out of plane when we're time to do the readout. And so we time the readout for when the blood signal is going to cross the null point here. And this time is going to vary based on the heart rate. So the scanners will automatically adjust that based on the heart rate. In the old days, they did. You just had to pick an inversion time and hope it was right. It wasn't right. You just changed the time and you did it again. You can also do an inversion time scout, which I'll show you that for delayed enhancement. So if the blood's moving through the plane, it should be black. And, and that, that's the key to the sequence. You can wait double inversion for T1. You can wait it for T2. You can wait it for proton density. You do that by adjusting the TR. You can do that also by adjusting the echo train length. Longer echo trains makes it more T2 weighted just in general. Um, shorter T TRs are going to make it more T1 weighted. But always check the CSF to know whether you're pure T1 or do you have some proton density effects. Okay, so here's two black blood sequences. There's another black blood sequence that we do. It's called HASTE, which stands for Half Acquisition, acquisition Single Shot Turbo Spin Echo. So half acquisition means that we're acquiring half of the case space. And if anybody has ever seen a picture of case space, has anybody here seen a picture of case space? Some people say no. Some people say yes. I'll have to put a picture in the next, next time we do this. Well, it looks like uh, kind of like a starburst pattern, but it's very symmetric. So because of the symmetry, you can acquire half of it and interpolate the other half. Whenever you interpolate anything in MR, you're going to have more noise and more artifacts. Um, but sometimes it looks great. So here's an example of the haste that looks as good as the double inversion recovery. The haste is you get the whole chest in two or three breath holds. The double inversion recovery, we get a little bit better spatial resolution, but it's one breath hold per slice. So we've actually gone, we've quit doing the double inversion recovery sequences on aortic studies and go into the haste to save time mostly, unless we specifically need it to troubleshoot. It's always there in our back pocket. But for mass cases, we always do double inversion recovery because you, you can't guarantee you're not going to have artifact-free images with the haste, and that's, a, that's an issue. Okay, so here we have a case. We have um, T1, 
So the CSF, so when we're looking for the CSF, we want to separate the cord from the fluid from the fat, the epidural fat. So the epidural fat here is bright, the CSF is dark, so this is T1. We see fat, there's multiple places to look for fat in an image. The fat here is bright, so this is T1 weighted, blood pool is black, double inversion recovery without fat saturation. And we see a lesion here in the posterior wall of the right atrium. This next sequence, we see black blood again, so double inversion recovery. Not great black blood. The CSF looks like it's a little bit bright, right? The spinal cord is also bright, which is a feature that we're kind of bright, which is a feature that we see in T2. And there is fat saturation here. So the periaortic fat is now gone. And this mass is now saturated. Whoops. So this was a lipoma. Okay, so we have a question here. So ghosting is where we see a part of the anatomy in the image which matches another anatomy, usually for, that can happen from breathing, but it can happen for other reasons. So when you see ghosting, you want to be able to identify something that's matched somewhere in the anatomy. Like this is an example of ghosting here and here. You see how these two lines are really parallel to each other? This would be ghosting. So most people got it right. So time of flight effect, that's where the blood has not flowed out of that slice. So this technique is best used in short axis to the direction of flow, perpendicular to the direction of flow, to give the blood more time or um, more chance to get out of that plane. So here, this is a long axis view of the heart, so we didn't really give it a good chance to get out of the plane. But we can also use this um, for physiologic reasons, too. So are we looking for low flow? Um, that's something we can use this sequence for. Okay. Here's another mass. So pulse sequences. I didn't show you the CSF here, but this is T1, T2. This might, I think this is the same mass that Ron showed the other day. Does anybody remember what this is? Nope. But this mass is also bright. A lot of masses are bright on T2. This is intermediate on T1. Huge left atrial mass. So what do you think about with left atrial masses? Myxoma. So this is a big myxoma. Whoops. <coughs> okay. Here we have more images. So SSFP, so CINE. With SSFP, usually the CSF is going to be bright. So a lot of T2 effects there. So T1 DIR without fat sat. T2 DIR. So blood pool is black here. With fat sat. Fat sat's not great here. Then we have a CT. So we're looking at is this mass here. So bright. Saturates with fat on T2. And it's also dark on CT. What do you guys think? Yeah. For the endoatrial septum. Spares the fossa ovalis, which is this here. Okay. Here's a question. What is the cause of the bright blood on this image? Okay. So 50% got it right. So that's good. Um, the wrong inversion time. That's good. So what happens here is once we've added gadolinium, now we've really shortened the T1. So because the T1 is now shorter, our inversion time has to be shorter. So this scan was, th there was no change made to the inversion time between the pre and the post scan. So you have to shorten the inversion time. Different scanners do it different ways. On our scanner, we do that by shortening the TR as to the minimum, usually about 350 or 400. That'll shorten the inversion time. So post-GAD, um, that does make the blood pool bright, but whenever you're doing um, a specific technique to null the blood pool, that's, that's, you can have the blood pool bright from your, your null time being off. So that, that's not a, not a good answer. Can you use that sequence to see enhancing masses by, and also by the blood pool? Yes. So here, we're, we're doing it to look for the enhancement of the wall of the aorta in this specific case. But you can do it if you have a mass that's so sort of pushing into the left ventricle, and you don't want any enhancement of the blood pool. You want the blood pool to be dark. Otherwise, you can't tell, is that rim enhancement of the mass, or is that just blood pool?
Okay, here's another one. Um, here, so notice that we have post-GED, but the blood pool is dark. So here we have the correct inversion time, and this is what it looks like. Here's another case where we have DIR, T1, with fat sat. We have post-GED, now the blood pool is black. But notice how the aortic wall is bright on both of these, so this makes it a little bit confusing. So what we've been doing now is going to gradient echo instead of DIR for aortic wall enhancement. So this is pre-contrast, T1. Here's post-contrast, and we can see that the wall clearly enhances. We're here, it's really hard to say, you know, is this enhancing or not compared to that? It's very difficult. So this was, this was a case of, of aortitis. You can see that the wall is thick. So having the GAD lets you kind of know whether it's aortitis or not. It's circumferential mural thickening. It's usually almost always aortitis, whether it's enhancing or not. This one? Yeah. Not sure. I don't know why. I haven't had any, I couldn't, I have not been able to find out why this happens. I haven't had a physicist be able to explain it to me. Frankie could never explain it to me. It was always bright before, so that's why we, we kind of quit doing this because you, get, you don't really get a good answer, or you always get a good answer doing this. The, one of the theories is that this is slow flow, actually in the lumen, and this is not the wall. But sometimes it actually looks like that's the wall. I mean, when you do a subtraction and put them right next to each other, it looks like that actually is the wall. So I don't really have a reason for I can't explain it, unfortunately. So I just moved on and went to a better sequence. <laughs> Here's another case. We have T1 double inversion recovery. Black blood, no fat sat. Here we have T2, black blood with fat sat. Here's a CT scan with contrast, obviously. Here's the, the gradient echo. And the gradient echo T1 post contrast, that's, this is the sequence that's used in abdomen for renal mass enhancement. It's what we use in the brain for tumor enhancement. It's what we, this is the vibe sequence that you guys are used to. So in the vibe sequence, um, the only thing that should be bright is stuff really that has GAD in it or has a really short T1 that's not saturated with the fat set pulse. So here we have a, a fluid collection, which is loculated. Intermediate to bright areas on T1. T1 bright areas, but heterogeneous also in T2, does not enhance, there's peripheral <laughs> enhancement. And this, I don't have the Hounsby units here, but this is 50 Hounsby units. So this is a pericardial hematoma. So that's how we use tissue characterization. Let's move on to perfusion. So perfusion, the idea here is using first pass gadolinium enhancement. Gadolinium, enha gadolinium is an extracellular contrast agent. The gadolinium never goes into the cell. So it enters the extracellular space and then washes out of the extracellular space. And that's the, the kinetics that we depend on with cardiac MRI imaging. If you look here at these graphs, so the remote myocardium, which would be normal myocardium, compared to the ischemic myocardium. And here's where we're looking to see a separation for perfusion. And this is with, with a stress perfusion agent. So this is kind of the goal is to get separation here. And this is from Raymond's textbook. The sequence that we use is called FLASH, which is fast, low angle, single shot technique. So that's a technique that you can basically acquire all of the case space in the, of this slice, but it takes about a 150 to 200 milliseconds. So we typically, we used to get three, now we can get four slices. So we get apex, mid, and base, and then we get a, a long axis view, the four chamber view. You can also prescribe this of a mass specifically to look for gadolinium enhancement first and second pass of the mass. This is what it looks like. So we always have stress on the top, rest on the bottom. Does anybody see a, a stress-induced perfusion defect? And if so, what territory? So LAD, circumflex, or RCA? So where do you see the defect? So if we had to give one vessel, RCA. RCA. So anatomy is not always consistent based on that model. You can have dominant RCAs that have a big POV that give part of this tissue, and the circuit in that patient will be non-dominant, and you just give one segment up here. 
But here, if this was one vessel, we would say RCA. And we're looking for the difference between stress and rest. So this is rest. We don't see a perfusion defect, and we see a nice dense perfusion defect there. So that's consistent with ischemia. We also have a nice artifact with fluid perfusion, which causes us a lot of problems. So we'll go to the question here. So what is the name of this artifact? Dark rim, 100%. You guys are awesome. The dark rim artifact. Exactly. So there's a couple theories about why this happens. So we'll go over that here in this review paper. So they tend to be most prominent at the blood myocardium interface, also oriented perpendicular to the direction of the, in the phase encoding direction typically. But they think this is from partial volume. So the perfusion is a signal star sequence because we acquire it so fast. It's typically thick slices, 10 millimeter thick, with not a very big matrix. So half of the matrix of what we typically do. So not, not very good. So we have a lot of partial volume averaging. Also, another theory is that the gadolinium being a heavy metal in high enough concentration will do the same thing as iron, will actually cause dephasing. So iron at low doses will give you bright signal. When the dose gets too high, it gives you start to get dark. And there's a contrast agent called ferrohene, which um, we use sometimes, which you can see that. Also, myocardial motion and the low spatial resolution contribute to this factor. But really what we're looking for is a, a thin, sharp line versus a gradient that fades into the normal myocardium. Um, this is also present immediately and goes away at peak enhancement, where the perfusion defect, ischemic defect, should be the worst at peak enhancement, and it should persist throughout the, the, the second pass. You can also use perfusion for masses. So here's an example of a of fibroma. This is the tagging case that we had earlier. You can see there's really no first pass perfusion of this mass. Here's that myxoma that we saw, same case. We can see it looks like there's a little bit of mild perfusion late. When we talk about second pass, what we mean is, is notice how it gets bright again here. So that's the contrast recirculating back into the heart. So we'll watch that again. So first pass, we're going to see the pulmonary artery bright, LV. Now this is going to get bright again. So now that's second pass. So now you've had time for more things to perfuse. This was that myxoma. Here's one of, one of Ayaz's cases. This is a patient with a large RV mass here squashing the right ventricle. We can see this enhances fairly rapidly. It's not the brightest enhancement that we see, but this is significant first pass perfusion. This was a lymphoma. And then we have this case where we have this thing, which lights up like it's another blood vessel. So this is hypervascular perfusion. Does anybody have a guess as to what this was? Yeah, paravenoma. In fact, on the delayed imaging, that, this actually washes out to the point where people think that it doesn't have delayed enhancement. Because it doesn't, because it's washed out. But that doesn't mean it's not a thuma. That was from uh, Kindergarten Cop. <laughs> it's my bad attempt at a Schwarzenegger impression. Okay, myocardial viability. This is another, uh, this, is pro this is the initial big indication for cardiac MR, was to try to identify segments of myocardium in patients that have obstructive coronary disease that is worth trying to save with revascularization. So if we look at a patient that's had a coronary occlusion, and what happens to the density and the thickness of the infarct as the patient um, gets more progressive, extensive, reversible injuries. So this is why we try to get them to the cath lab in less than 90 minutes. Because the longer you wait, the worse it is for the patients. Here's an example of an in vivo, in vivo study. Um, this is not, not in a human, obviously, because we have a <laughs> path here. But you can see the correlation of delayed enhancement with the pathology stain. So question, what is the weighting of the delayed enhancement sequence? So most people got it right, T1. So whenever we're looking at gadolinium enhancement, almost exclusively we're going to wait for T1. And so that's the point, is to look for the, 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 the scar in the myocardium, and we have to do that with T1 weighting. If we use T2 weighting, then we don't know if what we're seeing is edema 
or, or, or not. So that, that, that's an issue there. Okay. All right, so if we look at the recovery curves, so this is a, an inversion scout, a TI scout, and I've drawn curves over normal myocardium and infarction here in the blood pool and some other tissues just to show you what happens, and this is the recovery curve. So ideally, if we look at normal myocardium, we, the goal is to turn this black. So we look at the red curve, this is the null point. So here, this is the inversion time that we would want to pick. will give us the greatest separation between the, the blue and the red is going to be here. If we pick this inversion time, well, the, the blue, which is the infarct, is recovering, and the normal myocardium is on the way down, being inverted, but it will have the exact same signal. So we have to make sure we get the inversion time correct. There's another technique that sort of helps us with that. It's called phase-sensitive inversion recovery. And what it does is it, it acquires for the first, it's a two-heartbeat scan. So the first scan requires a phase reference image, and then it requires a magnitude image. And it uses the phase reference image and, and basically gives us an absolute value of what that signal is and readjusts the grayscale. So if you look at anywhere along that curve, you're going to have pretty good separation. So that's how when we have the inversion time here is wrong, we see that what's called the tram track sign. So if you see the tram track sign, your inversion time is too early. If the myocardium is homogeneously gray, not black, but gray, then you're too late. So PSIR will compensate for that. So this is the PSIR image of this slice. And we can see it, and it basically makes the myocardium black. Not all scanners have that technology. Um, so I'm fortunate that we have it here. Another advantage of the PSIR is that it gives you more separation between things that have GAD and that don't have GAD. So we use it to look for fluid. So here's an example of the magnitude image and the PSIR image. So things that really don't have a lot of GAD in them um, or have really long T1s are really going to go black. So we have black here. Okay, this is an example of what we're looking for. So myocardium that has a good chance of recovery has less than 50% involvement. Once we've gone over 50%, the, percent, the chance of recovery is poor. It's not zero, but it's poor. So we're trying to find cases where they don't want to revascularize. Because if you revascularize a segment that doesn't have a good chance of recovery, but there's a lot of scar tissue, well, those patients are set up for arrhythmias. So if you revascularize that dead tissue, it's still electrically active. And supposedly they have higher lethal arrhythmias, so we don't want to just do, um, plus if the success rate of a cabbage is poor, there's a lot of morbidity, morbidity and some mortality associated with doing a cabbage, so we don't want to do it unless we have to. Okay, here's another artifact. So we got a 0% success rate on this one. Okay, so... This is, a, this is an ant mini artifact, and what this is, this is an artifact that happens in the phase encoding direction, which typically is going to be the, the, the direction that's going to give you the shortest distance through the patient so you can scan faster. So if, and it's going to be right in line with a structure, which you can't see, but what structure li would live right here? CSF. So this is actually the CSF and the cord. So this is a ghosting artifact. And this happens um, when you have long T1 species. And this is what it looks like here. So if you have something that has a long T1, which is this gray, so the recovery is really slow. So it still hasn't even got back to the baseline by the time we're for the next inversion pulse. So then it gets flipped back up and then continues to recover. And that's why we see it later on in the image. Okay, here's another artifact. Very good, volume averaging. Awesome. And we know it's volume averaging because we know what the anatomy is like at the base. So at the base, the um, LV starts to come back in. And remember that these slices in cardiac MR are really thick. They're all eight millimeter thick. And that's to get, um, to do the scan in a shorter amount of time because these patients end up doing like 60 breath holds in a routine scan. So we have to, we can't do two millimeter slices, otherwise it would take an hour and a half or longer, and the patients couldn't tolerate the breath hold. So this is the corresponding SSFP image, so we're basically averaging the blood pool in the myocardium. All right.
we're going to briefly talk about phase contrast. So phase contrast is how we, is how we measure flow quantitatively. The way it works is that when you uh, um, basically apply a gradient to the, the dipole moments that are flowing through a, a gate, you can see, based on the Lamour frequency, how much the phase has changed and the phase is the direction of the dipole moment. If you know how fast it's spinning and you know the distance between here and here, you can figure out the velocity. You can also quantify the flow. So that's how we use phase contrast. Um, one more artifact question here. So what is the name of this artifact? Aliasing, exactly. So what happens with aliasing is that the um, speed of the flow has gone above what you prescribe as the velocity encoding gradient. So if you see that, you have to increase the, the velocity encoding number. There's a couple other cardiovascular applications. Um, people have used this to measure flow and coarctation. So it's a coarctation patient, and we do this maybe once every two years. But you're looking for increased flow. Um, here they're looking at the difference between flow and the true and false lumen. Here we're looking at measuring that flow of the, um, this is SAM here in an HCM patient, and they're actually directly measuring the flow in the LVOT. And we see that there's increased flow here compared to the aorta. And it should really be the same from here to here. And this is what they do in echo is they measure the flow here and here to see if there's any gradient between, across the valve for stenosis. Here we're kind of doing the same thing, but lower down for um, obstructive cardiomyopathy. Okay, lastly, we can use cardiac MRI for MRI angiography. Mostly we do this for the course of the vessels. The only place that does this for coronary artery disease is Beth Israel across the street. They're really good at that. Um, and this is some examples of correlation with cath. Okay, does anybody have any questions on some of the basic cardiac MRI principles? 